surf, strength, cut, fly. Long ago, HMs used to be the way to traverse the Pokemon world, but everything changed when ride Pokemon were introduced. Only this creepily silent child who wielded the HMs could show us the way. But when the world needed him most, he vanished. Many years passed and we were introduced to this little goober. And while they can wield the HMs, they have a lot to learn before they're willing to show us anything. But I believe that HMs are actually pretty good. HMs were part of the first six generations of Pokemon games as a way of restricting access to certain locations until the developers intended for the player to access them. This could include either finding the HM key item or having it gifted to you by an NPC in-game, and in every region they appear except for Unova, obtaining a certain badge to be allowed to use them outside of battle. Players of modern Pokemon games will often point that their retirement starting in Sun and Moon was a net positive for the series, and that HMs were an annoying mechanic people don't want to have to deal with. But were they really that bad? Before I share my personal thoughts, let's go over what the HMs from the first six generations are, what they do, and how to use them. Generation 1 introduced the first five HMs. Cut. Fly. Surf. Strength. And Flash. These moves would be retained as HMs for the first three generations. Generation 2 would add two more HMs, Whirlpool and Waterfall. And Generation 3 would swap out Whirlpool, adding two more HMs, Rock Smash, which was previously a TM in Generation 2, and the new move Dive. Generation 4 is where things start to get a little weird. Diamond and Pearl would demote Flash into a TM and drop Dive completely, adding two new HMs, Defog, and Rock Climb. But starting in Generation 4 as well, HMs would be constantly rotated based on which game needs which HMs. Defog would be replaced with Whirlpool in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. The Generation 5 games Black, White, Black 2, and White 2 would drop Rock Smash, Whirlpool, and Rock Climb, but bring back Dive just for one location, the Abyssal Ruins. X and Y would drop Dive. And finally, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire would bring back both Rock Smash and Dive. And while we're on the topic of Generation 6, uh, I made a mistake in my video on non-HM field moves. Remember that video? Well, I missed that Rock Smash is actually a usable field move in XMY, even though it's not an HM. So here it is in action. Uh, oops. My bad. Oh, and if I don't show this off, I know that someone in the comments is going to mention this. So yes, in the first three generations of Pokemon games, Cut can also do this outside of battle. And in Pokemon Emerald only, if your lead Pokemon has Hyper Cutter, it does this. Riveting. HMs could also be used in a few niche ways in all of the Hoenn games, as well as the Generation 3 Kanto remakes, Fire Red and Leaf Green, by utilizing braille puzzles that sometimes require them to be used in unconventional ways. While I'm sure most people clicking on this video already know what they do, let's quickly just go over what the HMs do. Cut allows you to remove small trees and bushes. Fly returns you to a previously visited Pokemon Center, usually located in most cities and towns. Surf allows you to cross bodies of water. Strength allows you to push boulders. Flash allows the player to light up dark places, making them easier to navigate. Whirlpool removes whirlpools in the water. Waterfall allows the player to climb waterfalls. Rock Smash allows the player to break small rocks that may be in their path. Dive allows the player to go underwater in certain areas. Defog allows the player to remove fog in certain overworld areas. And Rock Climb allows the player to climb up certain cliff sides. So now that we've covered what moves were HMs, we really have to ask the question now, what is there to like about them? Why do I like them? For me, the answer boils down to game design. At the risk of being a bit pedantic, 
What I like about HMs is it helps engage a player with the game. One great example of how HMs can be put to good use is in Kanto games, how they handle the HM cut. Now I know people don't usually like cut. In battle, it's pretty much really bad. It sucks. But the way they implemented cut in Kanto as an HM is actually really clever. You're forced to visit Bill's house early in the game and Bill gives you a ticket to board the SSN. When you go to the SSN, you'll find out that the captain is seasick, and by helping him get over that seasickness, we get the HM4 cut. Conveniently, this HM is needed to cut down the tree that's right next to the gym in the very same city, so the player has to use it. But even before getting to this point in the game, players might have seen suspiciously similar trees, maybe in Viridian City, or Route 2 on the way to Pewter City. This subtle messaging by the game informs us that there's side paths we can explore if we utilize new tools given to us. So, when the Vermilion Gym requires this move, we'll know that there's other trees like this, and we'll know how to remove them. From here, Kanto cleverly blocks away certain areas that are mostly optional with these trees, and because we know how to use Cut, and we've had to use it before, we can be rewarded with the investment of using Cut to gain access to more goodies on our journey. This even includes the HM for Fly next to Celadon City. And that's an overarching concept of why I like HMs. Investment versus payoff. I'm not saying HMs are perfect by any means, even in how it executes this. In fact, we'll talk about why they're far from it later in this video. But this is just an example of what makes HMs as a concept actually good. They reward us for using something in a way that's not required by the game, and we can get rewards for exploring more of the game that can help on our adventure. Here's another example. Surf in the Kanto games. Water is everywhere, up to the point where you actually obtain Surf, and because it's required to progress to Cinnabar Island, you will have to use it. Early in the game, you might have seen this body of water on your way to Rock Tunnel. If you come back after obtaining Surf, you're rewarded for an entirely new location, the Power Plant filled with items, new Pokemon, even a legendary Pokemon. Here's yet another example. In Gold, Silver, and Crystal, the move Whirlpool. It's required for the first time in Dragon's Den to obtain the Dragon Fang for Claire to give us her badge. Or in Crystal, you do this little test and you can get a Dratini that's, it's a little different. But by using Whirlpool in this way, you might be reminded earlier in the game, if you were an explorative player, on your way to Seanwood City. Seanwood? Cyanwood? You guys know which city I'm talking about. I'm gonna just call it Seanwood. Well, after you've used Whirlpool in the Dragon's Den, you might be tempted to go back to this area that had these Whirlpools. And, once again, you are rewarded for that investment with an entirely new location, the Whirl Islands. Yeah, you do still need other things in order to get the Lugia that is tied to the Whirl Islands, but it's still a new location that you get access to that's not required and is a reward for testing out and using something that otherwise a player might not want to use. Rock Climb and Diamond and Pearl are in the same boat. You have to use Rock Climb at least once in order to climb parts of Mount Coronet for story purposes. And there's numerous identical cliffs across Sinnoh. So once you've used Rock Climb for the first time, you might be tempted to go back to these other cliff sides and use Rock Climb and see where you can go, see what you can find. The Generation 5 and 6 games largely don't make HMs mandatory. There's a few locations here or there, depending on the game, that are required, but most of the time you'll obtain the HM and you'll never really need to use it. Both Black and White as well as XY have various places all over the sides of different routes where if you have the right tools, you have the right HMs, you can explore more of these areas, giving you more of what the game has to offer. And this goes back to my main point. They may get in the way, but they're a great way to invite players to explore more of the game without holding their hand or railroading them to the next generation. This is a criticism that a lot of people have had about games such as Pokemon Sun and Moon, where they're so linear, they don't have too many side areas to explore, and even then, there's no real investment versus payoff, and characters are usually railroading you to your next destination. You just kinda go. But HMs by contrast are a way to hint to the player that there's something else you can do, somewhere else to explore, but they don't escort you by an NPC or have it explained to you every step of the way. But again, I did say that HMs are not perfect, and it's time to play Devil's Advocate. 
There's a valid criticism where HMs often get in the way of a smooth gameplay experience. Having to drag an entire Pokemon around whose sole purpose is using HMs or taking up vital move slots on your actual team for these moves can be and in some games is an absolute pain. Games like Ruby and Sapphire, and especially Diamond and Pearl, overuse HMs to the point where your party's hampered with them to navigate. I can think of no better example of how egregious this can be than the victory road in both games. Hollins requires three to even get to it, and requires three more to pass through it, with two more moves being useful to make progression easier, even if it's not required. Thankfully, the Victory Road in Hoenn does have a Pokemon Center right outside it, so you don't need to carry everything at one time, but still. But that doesn't compare to Sinnoh. Words cannot describe the sheer insanity of Sinnoh's Victory Road. Five! Five required HMs! That's more moves than you can even fit on a single Pokemon. And what's worse is this is a new location with challenging trainers, lots of wild Pokemon if you don't have repels, and this is all right before the Pokemon League. Now, you could maybe argue that this is just an RPG utilizing resource management, but the games don't usually condition you into this level of resource management, and suddenly thrusting all of this on you at once? All this expectation to have all these HMs when you weren't really brought into doing this before? I, I, I get it, I can see why some may not like HMs because of this alone. Except for Mount Cornet earlier in the game, you're largely not expected to need many HMs all at once to progress. The game may ask you to bring one, maybe two at a time, but Victory Road wants you to bring more HMs than a single Pokemon can even learn at once. Your best case scenario is having one Pokemon exclusively for four of these HMs and one of your main team members shouldering the burden of having the fifth HM in its move pool just to finish the cave. And these are just two of the worst examples, there are others. What about in Kanto, where while you are hinted that there is a way to maybe push boulders around if you stumble around Fuchsia City, what's not hinted is that Victory Road requires this move. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but nowhere in the game, not even the rival just before Victory Road, tells you that you need strength to go through the cave. And I'm sure if you're a new player picking these up for the first time, going in blind, it could be gut-wrenching to walk into that cave, stumble around for a bit, and find that the only way to move forward is to use strength, a move you didn't know you needed, and you weren't told you would need. If this happens, and you don't have a Pokemon that can learn strength in your party, and in red, blue, and yellow, if you don't have the HM in your bag, you have to go all the way back to Viridian City, grab something that can learn strength, have strength on hand, and then you need to go all the way back to Victory Road all over again. And Gold and Silver is not a whole lot better. Waterfall is an HM, and yet no NPC gives you this move. Nobody tells you you need this move. It is a random item in the middle of Ice Path, and you need it. When you defeat Claire and you make your way east of New Barktown, in Tojo Falls, there's a waterfall sitting there that you may not have all the resources to get past. I get it. I get why some people don't like HMs when they're executed like this. One major problem I think HMs have that I've yet to bring up in this video so far is that you can't delete them by normal means. This is the entire reason why players will bring entire Pokemon along just to navigate areas that require these moves. If HMs could be removed from a Pokemon's moveset without needing an NPC to delete them, that would probably help. And here's the best part. In Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow, this NPC doesn't even exist. There is one workaround to not having this NPC. You could put the Pokemon that has an HM in the daycare and just let it level up enough so that it learns a move that overwrites the HM, right? You can't do that in red, blue, and yellow. The daycare man won't take a Pokemon that knows an HM move. If you teach a Pokemon a move that's an HM in red, blue, and yellow, that's it. They have that move forever. You can't get rid of it. Another major issue is that their execution is just spotty. The player might have to go out of their way to stumble upon the needed HM that's mandatory to progress later in the game, such as Kanto's Strength or Johto's Waterfall. Or you get moves like Defog in Diamond and Pearl or Flash in Kanto, 
where the move may not be required, but it's recommended, otherwise navigating the area is annoying, and yet obtaining it involves going far away from the locations that they're needed, and talking to an NPC that is entirely optional. The solution to this would be that HMs should largely be obtained within the story, and shown to the player what to expect when using them. It doesn't need to be in the form of hand-holding movements. I know many people have a strong distaste for Sun and Moon, among other games, for doing this. You could do something like Cut in Kanto, where you place the required obstacle just nearby where you obtain it, or Whirlpool and Johto, where it's not usually required outside of that one instance, but you have that one required instance, and then you can just use it freely as you wish. Black and White use this exact technique with the move Cut in the Dream Yard. You have to use Cut one time, it's the only required HM in the entire game in Black and White 1, and you learn how to use Cut, and then there's more trees along the various routes of Unova where you can cut them down and maybe unlock some side content, maybe some new items or a new portion of a route. Speaking of solutions that have been tried, and speaking of Sun Moon, let's talk about those games. Now, Sun and Moon, despite being the main games to be known to introduce the Ride Pokemon, were technically not the first instance of using Ride Pokemon as a way to substitute for HMs. No, that game would be Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, with the rideable Latias and Latios with the Eon Flu. The soaring mechanic, being able to fly over the Hoenn region and just drop yourself wherever you want, and you don't even need a Pokemon in your party with Fly? Yeah, it does take a little bit longer, but you get to explore the region from the sky above, and there's even more content that you can access through this mechanic. That is a good execution of substituting HMs for something else. Sun, Moon, Ultra Sun, and Ultra Moon, and Legends Arceus all have a variety of Pokemon that you can call up, typically called Ride Pokemon, and they have different tools that can be used to help you on your journey. Scarlet and Violet have a similar concept, but using just a singular legendary Pokemon, Coridon or Miraidon, that travels with you, and they're upgraded as you progress through one of the storylines, gaining new abilities to allow you to traverse more of the map of Paldea. The execution of these is kind of hit or miss, and some of them can feel a little underutilized, but they do evolve the exploration of the game as you obtain them to some extent. And then there's Galar, and the Rotom bike. Yeah, Galar has the Rotom bike. It eventually lets you ride the bike over water, and that's it. There's no other opening up of new areas based on having new tools at your disposal. You just have this one ability to cross over water with the bike, and that's it. The Let's Go games, as well as Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, also have their own roundabout method of handling HMs, or rather, a lack of HMs, by replacing the HMs with effectively the same moves that are not tied to hidden machines that your Pokémon have to learn. In the Let's Go games, this manifests as the partner Eevee and partner Pikachu learning secret techniques, which are the same as the HMs from the original Kanto-based games, while Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl have a new Poketch app that handles the HMs. Although, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl would go one step further, where all of the HMs are TMs, and if your Pokémon happen to know these moves, they can actually use them from your party, rather than using the app if you want to. There are modern solutions that Game Freak has tried. They haven't always worked, and I think one of the reasons is why the sense of progression in the games in general isn't made to be as open-ended as it used to be. You aren't challenged to try out new tools explicitly when you obtain new abilities. A lot of the game is a lot more linear. Galar doesn't have really any side areas to speak of. They were really cutting back on the amount of side places you can explore in regions like Kalos and Alola, and Paldea might have a big open world map, but it doesn't have a whole lot of meaningful side areas to explore. So the problem there lies with not the lack of HMs, they have something similar to it. The problem is just the general game design is different. They don't have an emphasis on these regions that are meant to be explored. They're more of a vehicle towards a destination rather than part of a journey itself. For some people, that might be fine. Some people, they just want to obtain the new Pokémon, collect the new stuff, experience the story, get into competitive battling maybe. They might not be into the whole role-playing part, but I know others, 
including myself, who are. Maybe I'm just old school, but for new locations, however simple, it was welcoming that there was this challenge for you to overcome when you had these obstacles in your path that asked you just a little bit more than just walk through this hallway. I enjoy seeing these suspicious obstacles and pathways and objects that I can't pass around on my first go and then obtaining something later that gives me this aha moment and the excitement of going back to see what I can find. Pokemon as a game is able to really capitalize on this, including its whole concept. They have all of these Pokemon you can hide Pokemon in these offshoot areas and reward the player for exploring by giving them new stuff to encounter. I mentioned the power plant. Electabuzz is found there and only there. Lapras in the Union Cave in Johto on Fridays. The Fuego Ironworks in Sinnoh. Optional areas with items and new Pokemon to obtain. And these are just examples that I could think of off the top of my head. I'm sure you might be able to think of some as well. I'm not saying that if you dislike HMs that this video should be a way to persuade you or change your mind. In fact, I think the valid criticisms I've outlined earlier in this video should be reason enough that if you don't like them, you can continue to not like them. Not everyone wants to bring a whole Pokemon with them that has just HMs in order to progress. Not everyone wants to take up move slots on their important team members, making them learn largely mediocre moves to progress somewhere, especially if they're not warned or prepared ahead of time. And I think it might be fair to say that no one likes how difficult these moves are to remove from a move set once taught, and I doubt that many people like the fact that HMs are something that causes a Pokemon to be blocked from moving from the Generation 3 and 4 games. Yeah, I didn't mention that earlier. If a Pokemon has an HM in a Gen 3 or Gen 4 game, you can't transfer it up. And yet, I still don't think they're bad. I like using my team members or Pokemon I personally caught to overcome these obstacles in the terrain and access new areas. There's this bit of storytelling with that. It's part of the journey, part of the experience. It makes me feel like I have my own contribution to the story, like this is me, my adventure in this game. It might be silly, but it's just that little personality that helps make the games feel a little bit more fun. I like HMs. I hate them, but I like them too. I really enjoyed using them, but I am still happy they're gone. I think it's very much possible to design a game and its world without needing HMs specifically. It's really on Game Freak to develop a world that can better take advantage of these ride Pokemon or ride abilities that they've come up with over the last couple of games. Maybe one day we'll have a region that is dense and full of rich content to explore and discover without needing HMs as a crutch. Feel free to argue with me in the comments about if there's regions that have already come out like Alola or Galar or Paldea where this is already the case and you would argue that these regions are dense with rich content to explore. In any case, that was a an overly long video on a retrospective of the HM mechanic, a mechanic that people celebrated its demise and yet, I think it was just a victim of spotty execution that could have made for great world building and great exploration. Thank you all for tuning in. There'll be more videos in the future. Drop a comment down below, like, share, subscribe if you're new. Have a good rest of your day. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you for tuning in and see you next video.